Find Your Fate, number 11, based on the sensational new 007 film, A View to a Kill, James Bond in Win, Place, or Die by R.L. Stein. You are James Bond, pitted against a ruthless madman with a sinister invention. There's danger and excitement at every turn, and the choices are up to you. Let's take our adventure. You are about to go on a secret mission as James Bond, Secret Agent 007. What secret has been uncovered in the icy wastelands of Russia? And why is the KGB willing to kill to keep it a secret? What evil plot has been dreamed up by the mysterious industrialist and sportsman named Max Zorin? And why is the beautiful and dangerous Mayday always at his side? As Agent 007, the world-famous super spy, these are only a few of the questions it will be your job to answer. You will choose your own actions and decide your own fate by following the directions at the bottom of each page. If you make the right choices, your mission will be exciting and successful. If you make the wrong choices, evil will triumph and the golden legend of James Bond will become a faded memory of the past. The race is on. Get ready to win, place, or die. Kamchatka Peninsula, Northeastern Russia. You dig your ski poles into the ice. You move quickly, almost silently across the frigid wasteland, your skis gliding across the rock-hard frozen surface. Not exactly St. Moritz or the slopes of Aspen, but you aren't skiing in this bone-chilling cold for pleasure. As James Bond, Secret Agent 007, you have a job to do. Agent 009 disappeared somewhere in this area. Your job is to find him. Beneath the gray sky, all is white interrupted occasionally by a scraggly pine or jutting ledge of gray granite. Suddenly, you are startled by a far-off high-pitched sound. What is that howling? Turn to page 12. You turn around. The mournful howls grow louder and then fade. Are there wolves somewhere nearby? All you can see is ice. Ice so hard your skis do not leave a trail. You ski on, looking for Agent 009. Agent 009 had contacted headquarters about an important discovery he'd made just before he disappeared. Perhaps the KGB captured him. Perhaps they left him out in the frozen wasteland to die. Will you find him in time to learn what he has discovered? Another sound behind you. This time it is definitely not wolves unless the Russians have trained wolves to ride snowmobiles and shoot. Turn to page 24. You have been spotted by the KGB. The goons are coming after you on snowmobiles. A rifle shot rings out, then another. Bullets whiz past your head. You duck your head down and try to ski faster, but they are gaining on you rapidly. You've got to find a way to escape. To the left, a low fog hangs over the flatlands. Perhaps you could escape into the fog. To the right is a tall, massive block of ice. There appears to be something inside the ice block. You must decide which way to ski, left into the thick fog or right toward the block of ice. So we turn left, go to page 49, or we turn right, page 38. Do we go into the fog or do we go towards what we may see something in the ice. Let's go to the right, page 38. You ski toward the block of ice, the roar of the snowmobiles growing louder as they pursue you. The ice block stands more than eight feet tall. You jam your ski poles into the frozen snow and stop short. Your eyes grow wide in horror. The front of the ice block is clear as glass, and inside this ice stands Agent 009, victim of the KGB. 
his face frozen forever in agony. Go to page 54. Is there a clue on Agent 009's body as to what he discovered before he was murdered? You have to find out. You press a button on the ski pole in your left hand and a claw handle pops open. You swing on, you switch on the power and the claw jolts and buzzes. You work feverishly, scraping away the ice. Can you find what you're looking for before the KGB catch up to you? They are only seconds away. The motorized claw burns away the ice. You reach the agent's frozen body. You search frantically for any kind of clue. There are only two objects that might possibly tell you something. A ski, a ski lift ticket stapled to the string of his parka and a silver locket dangling from a chain that he's clutching in his frozen hand. You have time to only take one of these objects. Which will you take? Well, I believe we want to take the locket. So let's go to page 93. Oh, are you kidding me? We're dead already. The KGB guards and their snowmobiles are only a few hundred yards away. You've got to get moving. You grab the locket and start to shove it into the pocket of your parka, but you cannot resist. You have to look inside. You push the tiny button on the side of the locket and boom! Curiosity killed the agent. The locket was booby-trapped and planted on 009. Nobody said this was going to be an easy mission, but you didn't have to go to pieces. Try to pull yourself together and start another adventure in this book. Well, that was quick. Okay, should we... Should we see what happens if we go left into the fog this time? Let's try that. Let's go left into the fog. Let's go to page 49. You turn left, and as you ski into the lower fog bank low-lying fog bank, you reach into the pocket of your ski parka and grab a small control module. Q, that master inventor, has equipped your ski outfit with a few unusual accessories. You press the little button on the control module. The roar beneath your feet is the sound of the jets that Q attach to the skis. You struggle to keep your balance as the jet skis blast you across the ice. See you back at the lodge, guys, you call to your startled KGB pursuers. Whoosh! As the roaring jets propel you away, the flatlands become hilly. The hills become steeper. You are skiing up the side of a mountain. The fog is beneath you now. You can see clearly that your jet skis are blasting you toward the edge of a precipice, a sheer drop-off, the side of the mountain. Page 63 this way was this just another way to die earlier already too in a few seconds the jet skis will carry you off the edge of the cliff you can see kgb agents or guards rounding the bend behind you several of them stand up in their snowmobiles and raise the rifles it's life or death time do you keep going take your chances and fly off the edge of the precipice or do you spin around and take your chances against the kgb guards you know what? Let's put our trust in Q. Let's keep going. Page 106. Well, they say that flying is the safest way to travel, you tell yourself as you ski off the edge of the cliff. You push a button on your backpack. Whoosh! The rocket pack, another clever travel accessory designed by Q, lifts you even higher into the air. The KGB guards stare helplessly from the edge of the cliff as you escape into the sky. You soar over the frozen valley below toward the slope of a mountain nearly half a mile away. As you begin to land, you realize you are coming down in a crowd. Who are all these skiers down here? Have you flown into another squadron of KGB guards? Let's go to page 52. Landing with a thud, you realize you have interrupted a practice session of the Soviet ski team. They scare in disbelief as the jet skis blast you off their ski jump and you sail in the air for more than double the world record. Poor fellows. Hope that doesn't give them too big an inferiority complex, you say, skiing away in safety. What awaits you back in London? Turn to page 81.
nothing because we didn't find anything. So back in London, back in the offices of Her Majesty's Secret Service in London, M greets you solemnly. I'm glad to see that you made it back safely, 007, your superior says, motioning you to a chair in the front of this large desk. Did you learn what discovery was made by 009? Well, no, you reply. Did you locate 009? M asks, his brows wrinkling beneath his clipped gray hair. Um, no, you reply. Then would you say that this trip of yours was a waste of time? M asks. I did, not, I did get to test out some marvelous new ski equipment, you tell him. Perhaps, 007, you should take that ski equipment on a long vacation, a long permanent vacation, M suggests angrily. You have failed in your mission. You did not find the missing agent. You did not learn his discovery. You did not even come close to learning about the mysterious man named Zorin and his incredible plot. Achoo! You sneeze into M's annoying face. Annoyed face. It seems all you have to show for your mission is a bad cold. Rest up, then try another path through this book to complete your mission. Ooh, this is a tough one. Okay, 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 okay. So, let's go back. Page 12. Go to page 24. So, we know we have to turn right. So, we're going to go to page 38. We have to turn right towards the ice. We go to page 54 after that. And then we have to pick the ticket. We know we must pick the ticket. So we go to page 87. Because the locket, which they was in the movie. That's why I picked the locket, because it was in the movie. All right. Page 87. You pull the lift ticket off 009's jacket. It is folded, and inside the fold is a tiny microchip. This must be what 009 discovered. Evidently... The KGB didn't find it. But now they will have you and the microchip if you don't get away. Fast. You activate the control module that powers the jet skis that Q designed for you. Where would you be without Q and his amazing inventions? You would be in much better shape. The jets blast the skis right off your feet. Go to page 100. You are running on foot now. Your boots digging hard into the frozen slick ice, slipping, stumbling forward. The snowmobiles are close behind. You reach into your backpack, grab an exploding flare, and toss it back over your shoulder. It explodes, blasting two snowmobiles into the air, spilling over a few more. That was your only exploding flare. Now what? Keep running, or try to hijack one of the snowmobiles and make your escape? Should we keep running, or should we try to get a snowmobile? Let's try to get a snowmobile. There's no point in running, you decide. Even you can't escape on foot from a dozen snowmobiles. You turn to face them. The lead driver ra raises a rifle and fires. You duck one bullet, then another. A snowmobile is roaring right at you. You can see the grin on the red-faced driver as he gets ready to plow you down. You dodge to the right as the snowmobile zooms past, missing you by inches. You lunge forward, grab the back of the vehicle, and pull yourself up behind the driver. He accelerates, swerves, skids one way, then the other, trying desperately to throw you off. Using strength you didn't know you had, you hang on and grab the driver by the shoulders. He reaches for a pistol, but you slap it away. A blow to the back of his neck, and the driver slumps down over the steering wheel, unconscious. You try to push him out of the way and then grab the wheel, but the snowmobile turns over on the ice. You let out an uncharacteristically uncouthed cry as it as it lands on top of you. Turn to page 115. Uh, I guess we should have just kept running, maybe? I don't know. You ignore the pain and pull yourself out from under the fallen snowmobile. The other KGB guards are closing in. You look from side to side. You are surrounded. It looks like an impossible situation. Impossible for anyone but James Bond, that is. With a burst of strength, you pull the runners off the bottom of the snowmobile. You step onto them and manage to fashion some skis and makeshift bindings. Then you reach into your backpack and remove two small rods about the size of chopsticks. You push and twist their tops and they unfold into regulation ski poles. Good old Q, he thinks of everything. You dig your poles into the ice and the chase is on. 
Your startled pursuers quickly get over their surprise and race after you with new determination. The ice begins to grow softer, occasionally interrupted by pools of water. The pools grow larger and even more frequently. You frequent. You are getting nearer to the Bering Sea. Skiing at full speed over these ice flows, you are faced with a decision. Which direction should you try, left or right? Will the famous bond luck carry you out of this frozen wasteland to safety? Pick a direction and find out. Ooh, left worked really good one time. Let's go right to this time, though. Right. Right to page 33. You turn sharply to the right and pull yourself over the ice flows. Your ski poles make a sucking sound as you pull them up from the soft slush. The snowmobiles have no trouble on this wet terrain. The KGB guards are only a few hundred yards behind you now. Straining every muscle, you ski onto a large ice flow with a mysterious gray patch in the center. You kick off your skis. You pound with, your, with both fists on the gray patch. The gray metal clangs under your hand. A hatch opens. There is a submarine hidden under the ice flow. You drop down the hatch and it slams shut behind you. The engines start up. You have escaped with the all-important microchip. Hope I didn't keep you waiting, you say to a figure wearing a parka. The figure turns around. It is Kimberly Jones, a beautiful young agent. She gives you a warm, friendly smile. You know, I usually don't allow myself to be picked up in strange places, you tell her with the famous Bond grin. She grins back. This is going to be a very pleasant trip back to London. Enjoy it while you can. The dangers have only just begun, as you will learn on page 16. Hey, so we escaped. We escaped. When you return to London, you are immediately summoned to the office of M, your superior, at Secret Service headquarters. Miss Moneypenny greets you at the reception desk. You're looking well, James. Cool weather. It does wonders with the skin, you reply. Cool weather? Is that what you call 40 below? She says with a laugh. M interrupts before you can answer and ushers you into his office. He gives you his usual somber look as he offers you the chair in front of his large mahogany desk. How was your trip, 007? He asks, nervously shuffling papers. I received a somewhat chilly reception, you tell him. But after I came into possession of this small item, things got quite a bit hotter. You place the microchip on M's desk. M frowns. This is a new kind of microchip 007, he tells you, holding it up close to examine it. I don't know of anyone who really understands what different, what's different about it. That's how new it is. Agent 009 stole it from the KGB. It's hard to believe that tiny chip cost him his life, you say grimly. My question is, M says thoughtfully, how did the Soviets get it in the first place? A good question, but learning the answer may cost you your life. Turn to page 44. M puts the microchip into a small leather case and tucks the case into his desk drawer. The chip was manufactured in top secrecy by a company owned by this man, M tells you as he hands you a color photograph. His name is Max Zorn. Is this the same Zorn who owns racehorses, you ask, studying the picture of the blonde man with, a strange, pierce, with strange piercing eyes, one blue and one brown? Why, yes. How did you know that? M asks. Oh, I go out to the track sometimes, you reply. Just for the beauty of the horses, of course. I seem to recall that Zorn owns a few second-rate horses, nothing one would ever bet on, if you were inclined to bet. Well, 007, lately these second-rate horses have been winning race after race. Unusual, isn't it? Very, you say. But we have gotten off the subject. What I must know is, how did Zorn's secret microchip get from his plant in France to the Soviets? Is Zorn working with the KGB? Did he sell the chip to them? And what does he plan to do with this chip? I surmise that my job is to find the answers to these questions, you ask slowly, as if you really had to ask. Right as usual, 007, M says with a nervous smile. Investigating Max Zorn and his mysterious world of racehorses and microchips will lead you into some of the most dangerous adventures you've experienced as Agent 007. First, you must decide where to begin your investigation. 
Do you choose to go to the racetrack outside London where Zorn's horse, Pegasus, is about to race? Perhaps there is something peculiar about why this second-rate horse, horses always win. Or do you choose to go to France and begin your investigation at Zorn's headquarters where the secret microchip was manufactured? Um, let's go to the racetrack. Let's try the racetrack, page 53. Before heading to the track, you stop in at Q's lab to see if he has invented anything that might be useful to your investigation. Hmm, this is most interesting, Q. You say, fingering a black metal box with a handle. What does it do? That's my lunchbox, 007, Q replies. Then he hands you a riding crop. I'm not going to race. I'm just going to be a spectator, you say, exam examining the riding crop. Q ignores your remarks. Pull the handle here, and it shoots out an exploding flare, he tells you. But be careful, don't drop it. It explodes on impact. Well, that's one way a jockey can win a race, you say, holding the riding crop more carefully. That's one way you can stay alive, maybe, Q says grimly. Then he attaches a small button to your jacket. It's actually a 35 millimeter camera, he tells you. Smallest one I ever made. I'll try to take some good pictures with it, you tell him. See you later, Q. Right now, I've got to see a man about a horse, as they say. You walk down to the street where a car waits to take you to the racetrack. Page two. At the racetrack, you take a seat in the grandstand and raise the binoculars to your eyes. There, Max Zorn, in his box, a tall blonde man, conservatively well-dressed, surrounded by a group of men in business suits. Next to him sits a remarkable-looking young woman. Her hair is cropped short in a crew cut, and she wears a tightly fitted leather dress that is the same color as her dark brown skin. Around her neck, she wears heavy jeweled chains. She looks very out of place among all these gray-suited businessmen. You use the tiny button camera to take pictures of everyone in Zorn's box. Do you recognize the woman? Wait a minute. Yes, of course. She is Mayday, a flashy and deadly agent who is said to work for the KGB. You focus the binoculars on Zorn. His eyes are not on Mayday, who is talking and gesturing to him. His eyes are on the starting gate, where the horses are being lined up. Zorn holds a silver-tipped cane tightly in his hand. He leans forward expectantly as the gate opens and the horses gallop out of the track. You glance at the betting sheet in your lap. Zorn's horse, Pegasus, is a 30 to 1 long shot. But long shots do come in. Turn to page 10. And they're off. Pegasus trails the pack all the way into the home stretch. The screams of the crowd grow louder as the horses approach the finish line. Suddenly, Pegasus puts on a burst of speed that causes the crowd to gasp. Zorn's horse speeds past the others and wins the race by a head. You look over to Zorn's box. He and Mayday have left it and are already heading to the winner's circle. Another victory for one of Zorn's inferior horses. You tear up your betting ticket in disgust. Then you look up and see a commotion near the winner's circle. Pegasus leaps away from his jockey, kicks over a trophy stand, whinnies wildly, tosses his head from side to side, and rears up on his hind legs. People run to get out of the way. Can anyone calm him down? Turn to page 27. Suddenly, Mayday leaps up and grabs the horse's reins. He's had too much, you hear her say. With incredible strength, she pulls the horse down and holds his head between her hands. The horse struggles to pull back, but she is too powerful for him. Soon he gives up. She lets go and he stands there without moving, lowering his head, his eyes still wild, but the fight taken away from him. How did the second-rate horse win the race? And what did he have too much of? You decide to go back to the stable to see if you can find any clues back there. Should you pretend to be a horse breeder interested in buying some of Zorn's horses and approach Zorn directly? Or should you just hide in the stable and see what you can learn? It's your choice. 